Welcome back, Health Psych. This is Eating Disorders Part Two. All right, let me get my PowerPoint up. All right, we see, I want you to remember this. We see that the eating disorders have the highest death rate, mortality rate compared to any other psychological disorder. And death from eating disorders can be both physical cause of death, it could be starvation, or it could be electrolyte imbalance for individuals who are binging and purging. That's the purging that's really, really awful for um, our electrolytes, which would be our potassium, sodium, calcium in the body that creates nerve conduction. So eating disorders more mortality than any other psychological disorder, but we also do see very high suicide rates um, for eating disorders. And I won't expect you to know all of these different things, but like just to give you an example, osteoporosis from malnutrition, cardiovascular uh, reactivity slowing, so you tend to see really low blood pressure, low heart rate. Um, Lanugo is an interesting one. Lanugo is when individuals, because they're, they're have anorexia and they're cold, your body actually creates more um, body hair. And it's almost like our bodies know how to grow fur to try to keep us warm. So that's a weird one. Um, hair loss, as an example, all the way to uh, heart failure, kidney failure. Um, and again, suicide rates are pretty high in eating disorders, particularly if an individual has had a chronic eating disorder over time. Now I told you I, I had issues with the way the DSM defined the eating disorders and I, I even have data to state my issue is, is justified. And in epidemiological research where they have tracked individuals with anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, and then there's this diagnostic category and you see this all in all over the DSM, but it's called whatever the diagnosis is not otherwise specified in OS. So in this situation, it'd be eating disorders, NOS, which would be an individual, a diagnosis that would be given to somebody who doesn't cleanly fit into anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder, but they clearly have an eating disorder and they're distressed and they're, they're seeking treatment. So that EDO, NOS. Anyways, when they compared crude mortality rate of uh, anorexia, bulimia, eating disorder NOS and binge eating disorder, it was the eating disorder NOS that had the highest crude mortality, meaning that the subclinical diagnosis um, is actually the most dangerous of the eating disorders. So um, when you look at the chronicity of this, um, and I have worked with individuals with eating disorders where it seems like the development of the eating disorder was very episodic in their life, um, and those individuals are more likely to have a complete recovery. I've also worked with individuals with eating disorders where the eating disorder has been there for so long that it's almost like a part of their identity. And then that starts to feel, it's almost like it feels like a personality disorder, um, that the eating disorder is their personality. And in my experience, there's more chronicity, more challenge in treating um, eating disorders when individuals present that way. In a longitudinal study, it showed 20 to 30% will remain chronically ill. Um, and in another longitudinal study, they found that 10% of people with anorexia die within 10 years with treatment, much higher a quarter of them dying within 10 years without treatment. Um, this website, I do not think is working, but I'm just going to try here and then we'll come back to the, um, no, it's not working. Okay. Okay, so let's just go back to the PowerPoint. I wanna tell you about um, what used to be on this website. I'm not sure why it got taken down, but it was a website where individuals were able to go on and post a candle when they lost a, a loved one or a friend to an eating disorder. And individuals would post their candle and, and sometimes they would name the individual, sometimes they would keep it anonymous. And it was all these individuals who had died from eating disorders and it was kind of honoring them. And it was sad. I mean, very, very sad. We had a, a, an individual who attended ASU who died and um, Nikki, and there's a plaque inside the library dedicated to her. Her family has donated a good amount of money to um, the university. Her name was Nikki Turner. Um, 
And so she, she was on that website. Karen Carpenter, the singer, um, back in the 70s, she died of an email, so she's on there. But it had people posting like, I lost my daughter, I lost my son, I lost my mom. I, there were women who were, had posts for all the miscarriages that they had had um, because of their eating disorder. There's a scene, if any of you have watched uh, To the Bone, um, it was a recent movie about an inpatient eating disorder program, uh, treatment program. And there's a young woman in the, in the residential treatment who is pregnant. And the other members in the, in the home had just given her a baby shower and she was just really looking forward to um, having her baby. And there's this horrific scene where she's screaming hysterically in the bathroom at night where she had gone in and made herself throw up. And as she made herself throw up, she miscarried her baby. And she's just absolutely hysterical that she's lost her baby and her baby was born dead and, and that she, she caused that um, with her her purging, very sad scene. And that's what happens to a lot of individuals. Um, so very sad. Um, treatment, um, there's the challenge that we have to make oftentimes medical doctors, psychologists, uh, nutritionists is can a person do outpatient treatment? Can they get their treatment team outpatient, which is usually that team, psychologist, uh, medical doctor, and um, nutritionist, or do they need enough support where they're, they're required to go um, inpatient? And I am a very strong believer that individuals with substance abuse, when they go to a treatment program, should not go to a generic psychiatric hospital. They need to go to an addictions program treatment. Same thing, I have very strong feelings about people with eating disorders. They need to go to an eating disorders hospital. They should not go to a generic psych hospital. Um, and I like, uh, I've had individuals go to Chapel Hill. I like the Renfrew centers. I've had individuals go to Ormuda Ranch. Those are programs. Um, the program that I uh, trained in at Radford, um, in Radford, Virginia, um, uh, St. Albans Hospital has since gone under, but that was a private hospital that had an eating disorders unit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Blue Cross Blue Shield lawsuit. Um, and I, this, this taught me something, and I've used this um, when I am advocating for a client who I feel like needs to go inpatient with their insurance company. And the Blue Cross Blue Shield lawsuit was, this was a family up in Michigan, Wisconsin, somewhere up in that area. And both physician and psychologist said, she needs to go to an eating disorders program. And they worked with their insurance and their insurance company kept coming back and saying, no, she's not sick enough. Her weight is not low enough. She's not sick enough keep treating her outpatient, we are not gonna pay for inpatient treatment. But again, the professionals, the medical doctor and the psychologist are saying, no, she needs to go. We need to, we need to put her inpatient. So her parents were so distraught about that, they, um, they decided to put their house up for sale, that they were gonna sell their house so they would have the money to send their daughter to a hospital program themselves. The teenage daughter found out about that and felt so bad that her family were, was gonna sell their home that she killed herself. And then that family <laughs> filed a lawsuit and won their lawsuit um, that Blue Cross Blue Shield in that particular case should have uh, funded because you had psychologists and you had physicians saying, this is the stepped care, the next step level of care that this person requires. So here's what I've learned over time. And I'll tell you how um, evil I've learned to be when I am advocating for a client who I think needs to go into a hospital program. So I was on the phone with, um, an insurance uh, representative at one point in time, and they wanted to send my client to Fry Hospital in Hickory, which is a generic psych hospital. And I was like, no, Fry is not going to do. We've got, we've got Mission in Asheville. We've got Renfrew. We've got Carolina House. I want her to go to a program in North Carolina that specializes in eating disorders. And then here's what the person on the phone was saying to me. What's her weight? What's her blood pressure? Da, da, da. No, she's not, she's not sick enough. And at that point, I was like, can you tell me what your education is? And this individual came back with, I have a bachelor's degree in something. Okay. And so then I just said, so you're not a licensed medical doctor. So you're not a licensed psychologist like I am. 
And that person's like, no, I'm not. I'm like, okay, so you can't be practicing psychology or practicing medicine. Is that what I am, I'm hearing? And that person's like, yes. Okay. It is my professional opinion, and you will also hear from her medical doctor that it is the medical doctor's professional opinion that this person needs to go into a hospital specializing in an eating disorder. Got it? Okay. And then I would say, do you realize that the eating disorders are the psychological disorders with the most mortality of all the psychological disorders? Get that? And then saying, okay, I am going to be documenting in my notes right now that it is my professional opinion that this person needs to go to an eating disorders program. And if they don't, they are going to die. And I am documenting that it is because of you, because you're not allowing, you're not going to pay for the patient program would be the reason if this person dies, it will be your fault. Boy, I've learned, man, you pull out words like that. People will hop to it. Okay. Let's get her into Carolina house today. We will pay for it. We will fully fund her hospitalization. Sometimes you got to advocate for your peace. Okay. So we know that scientifically CBT is effective in treating eating disorders in a personal therapy because of all the, you know, the secrecy and the issues that go on in relationships. Family systems therapy is effective. And we know that acceptance and commitment therapy are effective treatments. In the inpatient program, I haven't been involved in an inpatient program in a long time, but most of these programs are very interdisciplinary. You've got physicians working with dietitians, working with physical um, therapists, working with um, psychologists, all working together. Most of these programs have a behavioral structure where uh, patients are reinforced and get more freedoms for recovery behavior, and there's punishment for eating disorder behavior. So as an example, early on in a program, a person with bulimia is not permitted to use the bathroom alone. They have a nurse in there in the bathroom with them doing whatever they've got to do in the bathroom um, to prevent them from purging. Um, and then over time, as they are able to go and use a bathroom whenever they want and do so in private. Um, like I said, I would sit and eat with individuals and help be supportive of them um, when they were eating. Um, so all of these individuals working together um, and, and communicating together on a regular basis, which really creates for more effective treatment um, than just seeing one professional. Um, positive body image treatments. Um, and there are some wonderful compassion-focused therapies. Um, my friend, Dr. Catherine Catone, has done some really interesting work with that. Girls on the Run is a wonderful program where um, you get these older young, young women or teens mentoring uh, these middle school girls and they meet on a regular basis after school and they run together, but then they meet and do some really interesting like self-esteem kind of exercises and whatnot. And in the end and graduating from Girls on the Run, they run a um, 5k together. So the mentors and the gals um, run this road race together and celebrate the end of their program. What I love about Girls on the Run is it treats body as process. Guys are socialized to do this. You guys get raised a little bit more in our culture of what can your body do? What can you do? And girls get raised a little bit more to be viewed as a object. And that's the part that happens after purity than be viewed as a sex object. Um, and so Girls on the Run is teaching gals what they can do in their running and their fitness and their self-esteem to view themselves as more than just this person to be viewed and looked at or this sexual object. Um, some of the attunement work, and again, this is uh, Kuka Tone's work, she uses uh, yoga to help individuals learn how to get back into respecting their body. She's even done some interesting research with another friend of mine, Tracy Tilka, where they studied yoga instructors who really focused on individuality and yoga instructors who focused on respecting your body and breathing and learning how to do the, the poses and hold the poses and that type of thing versus yoga instructors that focused on, oh, if you do these planks, it will help you, your abdomen shrink, or if you do this kind of stuff, it will tone your, your booty. And they found that the yoga instructors that focus on the body as process 
um, that people have much better body image and self-esteem from attending those yoga classes than individuals who have attended the yoga classes where they're really focused on getting a certain look out of the, um, the practice. So it's really interesting. Intuitive eating, I am a big fan of intuitive eating, um, which is eating when we are hungry, stopping when we are satisfied. If we have the privilege, the privilege, to be able to think about what we want to eat. Do we want hot or cold? Do we want crunchy or soft? Do we want to cook for ourselves? Do we want to eat out? Again, there's a lot of privilege in that that a lot of people don't have. Um, that's more that process of, in, of intuitive eating, um, which is very different than say eating by the clock. It's very different from um, the clean plate club. If you all were raised in the, you know, you get served this food and you're expected to eat all of it, which is the thing that people do when they eat fast food. They get served these big, huge servings that's usually more food than they need. And there's this, this sense that I've got to eat it off, pay money for this, I need to eat it. Cookatone has also developed, you can, you can Google this if you want to take a look at it, or if you wanted to email me, I can send you a copy of it. A mindful self-care scale that I've used a lot and work with my clients in helping them learn how to respect their mind and their body and make sure that they are nourishing and doing the things that they need to do. Here's the intuitive eating. I love doing this, this kind of monitoring with my clients. What you do is you have them... Um, Think about every time that they eat, how hungry were they? Were they not at all hungry? Were they absolutely ravenous or starving? And ideally, people are eating at when their hunger is at about a five. And then ideally, they're stopping eating after they've been eating for a while at a five. Um, and if they are, if they stop too soon and they're still hungry, that's probably going to set them up for binge eating. Um, if they've overeaten and they are in pain or overfull, they'd be at about a 10. So as an example, here's this thing that happens for a lot of individuals. They start to realize this pattern. So they're trying to lose weight or they've got this drive for thinness and they're really trying to cut back on their eating. And so they wait and wait and wait. And so like people who bank calories, um, this is a really bad practice. We bank calories, don't eat all day long, and then reward oneself with allowing them to eat in the evening. And what ends up happening there is people overeat. They end up binge eating because they're so hungry if they banked calories and haven't eaten throughout the day. So if you start eating when you're starving, you're more likely to be like, oh my gosh, I'm out of control and overeat and be in pain here. So you just work with people and you have them monitor over time with the ultimate goal of if they're bouncing around that you want to move them into, hey, listen to your body, listen to your hunger. If you've got the privilege, again, go eat when you're at about a five and you're hunger and try to slow down the eating um, there's even research on meditation and mindfulness, that mindful eating where you really taste it. Remember the raisin um, in the John Kabat-Zinn? If you really slow it down and you taste it um, and you chew and you take your time and you pay attention to when you're full, then people are a lot less likely to overeat in those kinds of circumstances and be able to stop at about a five in intuitive eating. I want you to know about the National Eating Disorders Association. I'm not going to go through this stuff here, but I want you to know you can Google it. It's a wonderful organization for referrals, information for family and friends, um, and they do fundraisers, and it's just, it's scientifically based. I just, I, I love Nita. Um, when we're doing CBT with clients, we oftentimes need to get in there and find out what are their irrational beliefs or their irrational thoughts. Um, so an example would be my value as a person is tied directly to my weight. We try to get people with eating disorders to stop weighing. Um, a lot of times you have to have medical doctors weighing individuals, particularly with, with anorexia, as they're trying to re-nourish and regain weight. But there, um, most doctors will weigh blind. Um, uh, meaning that an individual, they'll weigh in and the doctors, like I, the local peds office, when I've got a client um, that the local medical doctors in the peds office, they will call me if my client has lost weight um, and, and let me know. Um, but as long as they are stable in their weight or they're gaining weight, they don't, they don't necessarily call me. Um, this example, like when my thighs touch together when I stand up, you know, then that, that stupid thigh gap thing that is a trend um, nowadays, so, so dumb. If your 
thighs touch when you are standing for a lot of women and men, like welcome to the world of being a human being, right? Um, so these would be some of the irrational thoughts that we have to, oftentimes we do self monitoring, like I said, with the food as well as monitoring the thoughts. And then we have to get in there and restructure and change some of these. Um, I want you to know about Someday Melissa, and you can Google this on your own, um, this link. It's very, very sad. Melissa was a teenager and she had bulimia and her uh, mom and dad had even taken her to a gastroenterologist um, thinking that she had some kind of medical problem with what was happening um, in her vomiting and that type of thing. And the, the gastroenterologist told the parents, your daughter has an eating disorder. I think you need to seek treatment for an eating disorder. And unfortunately, Melissa died. She did not get the treatment that she needed and she died. And her mom, uh, Judy Averin, has created Someday Melissa, an organization um, in honor of her daughter to try to fulfill her daughter's dream. And then Someday Melissa, she had written at one point, that someday I want to eat breakfast. Someday I want to keep a job for more than three weeks. Someday I want to have a boyfriend for more than 10 days. I'll love someone. I'll travel wherever I want. I will make my family proud. I'll make a movie that changes lives. And unfortunately, Melissa died before she was able to do any of those normal kinds of things. So very sad story. But in the organization, Someday Melissa, her mom has taken it upon herself. Um, she has created a film making a movie that will change lives and created this organization for advocacy for individuals with eating disorders. So feel free to um, Google and watch this link. Treatment of body image. I do a lot of body image treatment. Um, and interestingly, my interest in body image started from my interest in, in prevention of eating disorders. And then my interest in body image research um, leaked over into the fat talk stuff. Um, but one of the things that we do oftentimes in treating body image is have individuals do uh, mirror exposures. And you've got to certainly build a relationship before you do this. And I use a full length mirror in my office. And initially I allow my clients to be fully clothed, even in baggy, heavy clothing. And we'll do mirror exposures and I will have them. So they have to stand up there and look at them in full length. And then I have them tell me what they're paying attention to and what they dislike and what makes them anxious. And I've even had clients before get up there and just burst out in tears. Um, but it's very diagnostic for me. Um, so as an example, I had a client at one point who would really focus on her cheeks. And if her cheeks were gaunt, she was lean enough. But if her cheeks got puffy, she was too fat. Um, I've had clients focus on their, their armpits, um, their, their abdomens, their thighs, all kinds of different things. It was very diagnostic for me to kind of understand what they're focusing on and what they dislike. Weirdly, I had a client recently who was struggling with uh, some anorexia behavior and some bulimia, and she would get up there in the mirror and go, I'm too thin. <laughs> it's like, I'm, I'm too thin, I want curves, that type of thing. And then we were able to use that diagnostically. It's like, okay, you want to go through puberty and, and, and get curves, but yet you're starving yourself. Like, how are you gonna get to that goal with that type of behavior? And that's when we were able to realize that a lot of her eating disorder behavior was more about anxiety and control and not even moving in the direction of her body image goals. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of what else I want to talk about with the mirror exposure. I had clients um, burst into tears and then I, I, will take, I will take notes as they are examining that because we're going to do cognitive therapy based on the things that they are telling me. I had a teenage client at one point in time got up in front of the mirror and she's like, you fat bitch, you lazy fat bitch, you eat all the time and you overeat. Um, and I was able to take what she was saying to herself and use that in cognitive therapy and say, okay, your best friend, would you call your best friend a fat bitch or lazy fat? You know, all this kind of, she was like, no, I would never say those. First of all, I don't think that way about my friend. And no, I would never say those things to my friends because that would be horrible. It'd be mean and abusive. And she was able to make that like, ah, uh, ha. Like I think about everybody else in a loving, caring way, but I am being mean and abusive in my head to myself. And eventually she was able to, in her mirror work, to get up there and go, this is me and I have curves. I am curvy. Some people are curvy. Some people are not curvy. I am curvy. It was very, very different from looking in the mirror and calling herself a fat bitch. Um, so we, 
I also do a lot of acty kind of stuff of helping people think through their goals and help them realize if their uh, eating disorder behavior is not helping them live out their values and their goals. Um, I'll let you read this. Again, person in the throes of body image and eating disorder. Prevention programs. Um, I want to talk about things that high schools and colleges do all the time that are horrible and they backfire. Um, our college used to do this. Our university used to do this. Thank goodness the people in our counseling center nowadays are not doing this anymore. I'm very glad. The, the classic one-shot program would be where you have a person who has recovered from an eating disorder or a panel of people who struggle with different eating disorders um, and you invite people to come to this program. It draws a crowd in universities and high schools. People come, it's usually very emotional and they get all kind of like, oh my gosh, look what this person went through. And, and, and universities do this all the time. Again, I'm so glad ASU has stopped doing this. Um, and it's considered to be this great program. It's supposed to prevent eating disorders. It's supposed to encourage people who have an eating disorder to go get treatment. And, but when it's been studied scientifically, this is some of Tracy Mann's research, it backfires. It actually creates more dieting and more eating disorder behavior in the people who are watching this program of these individuals who've recovered from eating disorders. And one way that I think about it, and I'm, I say this kind of facetiously, the individuals who are speaking in those panel discussions who have recovered from an eating disorder are the people who have recovered. They are not the dead people. They are not the people who have died from an eating disorder. So the message I think that gets conveyed, and even though this is not the intent, is you can tinker around with these eating disorder behaviors. And when you are ready to get better, you go into treatment. It may be hard work, the treatment, but, but you can get better. You can be like me. You can be recovered, that type of thing. And that's, we see the same thing in suicide prevention. Um, panels where the people that you're listening to are the individuals that were suicidal that have now healed they're not the dead people okay um, so anyways I want to talk about some other programs operation beautiful I don't know if any of you've heard of this this is where it was developed by Caitlin Boyle where people would put sticky notes in public places so like women would put sticky notes in bathroom mirrors or something like that and the original sticky with notes are you are beautiful or you are a strong woman that type of thing it makes a lot of sense to me and I think it's a wonderful intent operation beautiful neural you can google this and read up about it there are a lot of people who feel like it's really touched their lives and has, has helped them feel better about themselves um, but there's no scientific evidence that that is effective um, I do want to talk about tri delta we don't have a tri delta on our campus they do a fat talk free week um, every spring um, and it's an intervention uh, in one study that has examined it. It does seem to help individuals lessen their fat talk. Fat talk, by the way, and I've written a book on this, Fat Talk, A Feminist Perspective, is when women kind of whine and complain about their appearance and complain about their bodies, um, usually to other women. Um, and we know that it's associated with uh, poor body image, poor self-esteem, depression, anxiety. And so as a, a, my, my book, Fat Talk of Feminist Perspective, as a feminist, I really encourage people to become aware if they're engaging in fat talk and really try to reduce their fat talk because we know it's associated with bad stuff. The Body Project, our university, our counseling center, yay, um, Dr. Ashley Wilson over there, our counseling center has bought the training um, for the Body Project. I did the training um, with uh, a bunch of students in my research lab. It is a wonderful program that has been shown scientifically to raise self-esteem of girls and women, um, to improve body image. Uh, there's even programs that have been done with men. There are programs that have been done with athletes. Um, and it's a cognitive dissonance-based program. So as an example, one of the activities that, that people do is they critique the media um, they talk about what is considered to be ideal in appearance in the media and they critique that. They, at one point, they write a letter in their homework assignment to either a little girl, it could be their sister, it could have been their younger selves, 
um, it could be a, a cousin or whatnot, they write a letter as an adult knowing what they know now and they write the letter and they give advice to a, a little girl. When I did the training, my students and the people who are participating in this training had me in tears multiple times. It was just beautiful kinds of things that they would write. They also do a lot of in the body project of learning how to counteract fat talk. We've got a study that we're about to run um, looking at how to, how to best counter fat talk um, scientifically. We've got a study that we're working on that. Um, without hurting somebody's feelings. So like, let's say somebody's kind of fat talking to you going, oh my gosh, I gained so much weight on my vacation, blah, blah, blah. And that what normally that does is it pulls that other person into fat talking themselves. And we know that that back and forth fat talk is bad for individuals' um, self-esteem. So how to counteract that fat talk. My favorite that I heard when I did the body project um, training was a person's fat talking and their friend says, don't talk about my friend like that, meaning you're talking about you in a way that I define, don't talk about my friend that way. Um, and I love that one. Um, so know that our university, our counseling center, Dr. Ashley Wilson, who um, oversees that outreach, you can, if you want to join a body project group, um, they meet twice for two hours and there's homework in between. Um, and then if you wanted to train, as a peer leader. It, what I love about the Body Project is it's sustainable because they train people and those individuals tend to benefit from being a part of a participant in the group, but then they train peer leaders to keep running the group. So you don't have to have professionals at the counseling center running groups. You've got people who have trained as peer leaders running the groups. Um, and so it's a great program. Okay. There's my book. If anybody's interested in it, I can get you a copy at a very significant discount if you wanted to email me and I could sign it and mail it to you. It's also available on Amazon. Outcome of effective body image treatment makes people feel better about themselves. All right, everybody. Hey, it's lunchtime for me and I'm hungry. I'm going to go fix me some yummy food. That is the end of part two of our eating disorders lecture.